It's August 31st. This is Marie, and I'm leaving with my National Fire Team to go to um, Atlanta, Georgia, to join up for the Hurricane Katrina relief efforts. Our first briefing by Area Command, Edie Williams Rhodes team. He said it'll be a challenging assignment that will be in an area with no power, water, cell service. And our mission was to go to Moss Point, Mississippi, to set up, establish, and run a base camp for a thousand emergency workers. We we're told the people down here are very nice, but they're angry, hungry, thirsty. So as we head down to these areas, if people try to stop us, roll down the window a little bit, answer questions, and if anything starts taking place, we were to keep driving and not stop. It was a six hour drive from Atlanta, Georgia to Jackson, Mississippi. We seen gas station lines at least two miles long. We're standing on the foundation of a house right on the Gulf of Mexico. The Gulf's probably 30 feet away. Um, looking down the coast, uh, there's not one house that we can see in either direction. They're all completely gone. The smell down here is pretty bad also. It, uh, you have the, the bayou and the mud. Every now and then you'll come upon a pile of rubble that we're fairly certain has a, some kind of a dead body in it, either animal or human, because the smell is just horrible. Uh, there's raw sewage floating down the street we're at the, because we're at the low end. It just bubbles up out of the manholes and, and uh, rolls down the street. We just ran into a group of firefighters from, uh, I believe, believe they're from Glendale, Arizona, that have been assigned to search the area. And they're also experiencing the same frustration we are that they, uh, that there doesn't seem to be any coordination or any direction here. They were just dropped off and asked to search an area and then when they're done there they'd uh, report back and they'd go search another area but all the street signs and all the pretty much all the road signs are gone so you really are kind of guessing where you're at. The use of wildland firefighters on all risk assignments is based on our knowledge of the National Interagency Incident Management System or NIMS and more specifically the qualifications, skills and experiences that we've gained in the use of the Incident Command System or ICS. Wildland firefighters have not only responded to the hurricane relief efforts, but we've also responded to some rather unusual assignments. We helped stop the spread of the exotic Newcastle disease, which was spreading through the chicken population in Nevada. We responded to the Columbia shuttle recovery efforts. And through the United States Agency of International Development, or USAID, we helped with the eradication of a locust infestation in Western Africa. We've been increasingly called upon to help our international partners in various capacities. It's not that uncommon anymore to find wildland firefighters that have taken overseas assignments. We responded to floods, tornadoes, and even the aftermath of the 9-11 terrorist attack. The 2005 fire season will probably be remembered more as the 2005 hurricane season. We sent over 13,000 firefighters to help support hurricane relief efforts. Looking ahead and preparing for this fire season, we can only wonder what we may be asked to do next. What we do know is that when a national need exists, be it a hurricane, earthquake, volcano, flu epidemic, or whatever, our assistance will probably be called upon again. So the questions that beg to be asked are, how do we prepare for these non-fire assignments? And how do we keep ourselves safe when we're on these assignments? We recently talked to some people who just returned from all risk assignments and here's what they had to say. As uh, I got uh, the resource order, uh, the first thing I did to make sure of what we were going to do so I could brief the team in route was um, call the local unit, call the, uh, the four supervisor's office in Jackson, Mississippi and talk to uh, the lead dispatcher, uh, talk to the expanded dispatch folks. And it helped quite a bit. I think this is sort of an unusual situation and is that uh, several of the team members knew a lot of the folks from Mississippi that we'd be working with. But um, all the information that we could gather still didn't prepare us for what we were actually faced with. Um, as we got onto the incident, um, it was a uh, make it up as you go sort of a thing. We actually had to saw our way into our ICP. Um, and I don't think any amount of preparation that the forest gave us, even though the delegation of authority was very good, very thorough, 
um, it just didn't reflect the magnitude of what we were faced with and then all of the uh, uh, the other things that sort of accumulated got tagged on other duties as assigned I think the team in dealing with uh, the human factors uh, were uh, probably a lot more challenged than just you know taking 20 saw teams and shot crews and you know sawing our way through the forest to southern Mississippi to try and get roads open you know that was sort of routine you know we felt comfortable doing that we know what we could do but you know in dealing with all of the people that had lost everything um, the first impression I had as we got down on the south end of our assignment and in Gulfport and making contact with one of our uh, other teams from the Great Basin down there was uh, you know, just the smell uh, the stench of rot and destruction and death and you know though it was very unusual the physical factors that we were dealing with there especially in Mississippi uh, sleeping out on the ground um, you know the uh, the message I guess to folks that would find themselves in something like that is you've got to prepare yourself probably as much mentally as you would physically for the discomforts the uh, the lack of amenities uh, that you should need uh, prepare to go and be self-sustaining for uh, several days until they can get an infrastructure set up because in a lot of these cases at the onset of these disasters there is no infrastructure what you take is what you'll have um, take your medications that you might need personally um, uh, if you can I know there's weight limits on aircraft and stuff but make sure that if there's a group of you going make sure you've got uh, uh, first aid um, bottled water uh, rations, MREs, you know, if you can't take them with you, make sure that it's on that end set up for you. And I know a lot of these people that are on the receiving end are scrambling to set stuff up for you to make you um, effective and efficient, uh, but uh, they may not have the wherewithal to do that if everything that they have been depending on is destroyed. So take as much stuff as you can with you that you think you might need. Batteries, uh, extra batteries for your flashlight, your radios, um, sometimes that radio and a repeater are going to be the only communications in existence to where you're going. So um, prepare ahead of time. Forewarned is forearmed. Be, expect the unexpected. You have to just know that you're not going down there as a firefighter. Strike team leader means nothing uh, to, to all risk assignments. I mean, functionally, the incident command system works very well for us. There are varying, varying degrees of how much the incident command system is used amongst the agencies, amongst FEMA, the National Guard, and us. And I spoke to you earlier about how functionally everybody works really well up and down their chain, their functional chain of command, including FEMA, the National Guard, um, incident management teams, and the, and the federal agencies. They work really well. The challenge is breaking down those barriers between those functional changes and getting that communication going across the board because a lot of the complexities and difficulties come from ver that very thing. So if you're, if you're a firefighter going down with a team or on a single resource assignment, um, don't go there expecting to be able to acquire the things you need. Come with what you need uh, because you'll most likely be stuck using it. Situational awareness is, is probably one of the most important things because we are brought in in a capacity to provide aid in an environment that we're not used to. So one lesson I learned is uh, there are the obvious hazards, there are the obvious threats, there's the piece of roofing hanging off the roof, there's the large chunk of metal, there's uh, the nails on the ground. There are the things that just automatically come to mind. But there, there are things that you, know, you may not consider. Uh, we were in an area where there happened to be just a lot of insulation floating around in the air. You couldn't see it, you could feel it. It was hot, it was humid, and it was real sweaty. You'd feel it on your skin, but you know you weren't really thinking about, ah, I wonder how healthy it is to breathe this stuff. You know? and, and we found out a lot of the folks on our team started hacking and, and, and just were very irritated in the lungs. So it's, 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 hard, to, it's hard to nail down situational awareness because um, there's just so much going on. Or the other end of the spectrum is you could be in a place that's just untouched by any any, any destruction, any disturbance, and you'll be fine. The important thing is to go in knowing that you might end up in one of those areas where the, the, the conditions are really bad. It's just your situational awareness has to be high as it always is for a firefighter or an operational person, but 
you just really have to take everything. It's, it's a very broad scope. You have to look at everything around you. Like look up, look down, look around. You're really assessing everything. When you're going on an all-risk assignment as a federal employee, uh, the experience levels and the people you'll be working with are going to vary quite a bit. Um, you may know more than the person you're working for. Um, you may be working with a person that's learning as much as you are and is on, this, on the same level as you are. So you really have to tap into who's with you and, and build a working relationship with the folks that are with you. On a single resource assignment, you're, you're going to be working for someone directly. You may not know them very well. Um, in the team environment, you're working with folks you're comfortable with. You understand that chain. Uh, you know their capabilities, and it works really well. So you really have to use who you have and what you have around you to your best benefit. And there's going to be a learning curve to figure out how to do that, because a lot of us aren't sure how yet. You know, I, the personnel that I uh, were involved, was involved with from the Wildland Fire groups did an outstanding job. I'm a firm believer that when people are asked to rise to the occasion, they will, and I think the wildland firefighters have a lot to be proud of. I found it very beneficial to, um, uh, as a team, to find out special skills when people were coming in. Who's a forklift operator? Who has some carpentry skills? Who's done uh, flagman type of work that we were doing in traffic control? Um, those kind of skills were very important to find the special skills and um, we're so used that we know how to fight wildfire very well or do wildland fire use and those type of prescribed burning operations um, that we really had to have everybody you know evaluate what is the risk management and how are we mitigating our risks in these situations uh, so when you're doing these new tasks, you have to look inside the organization. You have to look outside the organization. Um, we had a FEMA uh, administrator that had run one of these areas uh, previously in Florida. Um, when he showed up and he brought some ideas and safety stuff that we really hadn't thought about that I thought was very important. Then we did do AARs uh, with crews uh, and making sure of personnel that uh, there was feedback, which um, we were doing AARs with some crews when they were leaving. I think uh, it would have been more beneficial uh, in hindsight to do more frequent AARs. I think that would have been down at the unit bases and, and that just so we could get some of this feedback coming back and how people were functioning and ideas and that. As far as heading out on all risk assignments, I think, I think it's key because of the way we've been called on. We, are, we have been and will be, I think, continue to be called on for all risk. I think at the start of the fire season, or when the, when the crew gets together for the wildland fire season, they talk about that potential with the understanding that, hey, if it does happen, maybe right up front saying, does everybody understand what we might be involved with here? And there may be some folks that say, I'll fight fire, but I'm not emotionally prepared to go and do those sorts of things. Maybe because an experience they had a previous year in an all-risk incident said, hey, it wasn't good for me and I don't want to do that. Now again, that could be a crew issue, but it may, I think it's only fair to the crew members that they have that open discussion at the start of the fire season before we get into the all risk, which is usually, I mean, the, the, the big events, certainly the past few years have been the hurricanes. But again, uh, you know, the issue doesn't mean that, you know, if, if the shuttle, Columbia shuttle had, had landed in Texas in August, then there would have been uh, maybe some different prioritization of, of, uh, of our resources, of our wildland fire resources, uh, maybe to go and, and share some of our resources in the recovery efforts. So it could come quickly, but I think as the, crew, as the crew comes together, initially at the start of the year, whenever that is, they should talk about these issues. And I think that is a key, rather than all of a sudden come late August, early September, and uh, crew members find themselves on a plane going to Louisiana and really haven't haven't talked about it, haven't thought about it, and hadn't made that uh, decision in the minds that uh, they're ready. In a sense, they've begun to emotionally prepare themselves for this type of event. And I think our, our involvement should be uh, in those areas that we have the expertise, we have the qualifications, and in a sense, we have this, in a sense, the safety and security training that will get us, in a sense, keep us out of trouble and not get us into trouble. And. Um, I mean, one example I heard of the, that one group was uh, part of the hurricanes where, you know, they, they got to the assignment and they said, here, put these 
you know, these uh, uniforms on because you're going to go in and, and pulling debris from this hazmat area. And he said, excuse me? I mean, that, at least apparently that crew said, wait a minute, we, we're not trained in this. We don't, you know, apparently it takes, uh, I don't know, several hours to maybe 40 hours to learn how to properly use the gear and, and uh, to make sure you don't injure yourself or expose yourself through, through um, tearing the gear. And so they said no. So again, if we do get called to the all-risk, I think it's, it's incumbent upon us to make sure that we tell those folks that have asked us to become involved, that we, that we define what we can, can't do, will, and won't do. I think we're finding in these all-risk uh, incidents that we, we are drawing on different skill sets than, than we would normally just have for the wildland fire environment. And I think it is good for a crew to sit down once they get to an all-risk incident and say, okay, evaluate what's, what's, what are they asking us to do, and do we have the skill sets within the group here, within the team, within the crew, that can help to meet some of those. And I think uh, that's important because that one could keep you, that, those skill sets could also be help you with the situational awareness because those folks may know what can get you into trouble or not uh, that you may not know in, in, as a crew for a wildland fire environment. So I think, yeah, I think, I think those types of, uh, um, I guess, uh, evaluation of the skill sets within the crew, team, whatever, are critical. It's hard to be involved in any major disaster and not have some sort of emotional response to it. This is especially true when you find yourself working closely with people that have been affected by the disaster. To get a better handle on the emotional side of all-risk assignments, we'd like you to read the information reprinted in your student workbook. The first one is a section taken out of the Field Operations Guide, or FOG, for Disaster Assessment and Response. This guide was developed by USAID, the Bureau of Humanitarian Response, and the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance. It was modeled after the NWCG Fireline Handbook, and it contains information on general responsibility for disaster responders. The section in your student workbook is on personal health and critical incident stress. The second write-up is from the final report submitted by the Hurricane Katrina Safety Assistance Team. This is only a short portion of the entire document which could be obtained by visiting the Lessons Learned Center website listed in your student workbook. 